so my name is Carsten Loll, partner at Linklaters in Frankfurt and Munich. I'm ba basically doing real estate transactional work, so a classical real estate guy. Um, we do not only do uh, transactions in Germany, but across Europe, um, especially with some portfolio deals in the CEA. Great. Lars. Yeah, thank you. Lars Schniedrich. So I'm in the industry since roughly 20 years. Uh, started in banking and then moved in 2008 to Vonovia. And then since the last two years with Core State, started as a CFO. And as you rightly pointed out, just since beginning of the year interim CEO and since April as CEO. Great. Great. My name is Nathan Gelbert. I'm a partner with PwC Legal. PwC Legal is a law firm uh, belonging to the PwC network. And uh, I'm in, in real estate and heading our Berlin uh, transaction team. Yeah. Great. To be okay. Tobias Schultheis, I'm the founder uh, of uh, Blackwood Real Estate, which I set up some eight years ago. Um, earlier this year, we, together with a friend, I, I founded Blackbird Munich. Um, we also have Olaf Hütten, maybe someone of, some guys here know him. Uh, he's my partner from, from Cologne. What do we do? Um, our core business is to um, advise sellers in, in, in selling real estate, uh, commercial real estate in Germany. And um, four years ago, we started um, setting up and initiating joint ventures for commercial real estate who needs some, some refurbishment. Yeah, that's basically it. Great, thank you. We haven't got time to go through everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll be able to introduce yourselves as it comes as it goes along. Um, maybe um, just, let, let's just start with you, Carsten. In, in, in terms of some of the macro things that we saw there in Thomas's um, presentation, um, how do you see that, I, I, I guess, um, how do you see that influencing at the moment, particularly in Germany, um, the real estate sector? <clears throat> I mean, I think Thomas rightly pointed out um, that things seem to change in terms of the interest rates. Um, and I, I agree, I, I was rather sceptical two, three years ago as well. Um, in terms of the market, I'm, I'm still skeptical because I think the pricing is high and there's a lack of product. However, I'm convinced that the in, now that the interest rates stay where they are because the southern European states basically can't afford higher interest rates and given Brexit, I think that puts the rest of the EU rather together than apart. Uh, otherwise, it falls apart. So I think the only way the ECB can act is to keep interest rate, rates low. And that means you have to invest into real estate. So it is. I think that the market will remain as is uh, for a couple of uh, years, three, four, but I think in terms of the transactions, and some of us, including me, live from the number of transactions as well, it's not too easy because the numbers are significantly down if you compare them to 2015. And uh, I lost so many finals and semi-finals for clients this year in bidding processes. It is it is a bit pain, a, a pain. So so I think that's the problem to find the product and to be the winner in a in a bidding. Yeah, <coughs> yeah I share this. Um, it's interesting. I share many of your slides, and basically, it's also part of our business model. Obviously, the whole things about the bads, about the micro living, we are clearly following their mega trends that has happened. Times have changed in the work we live, and in particular the next generations, and uh, in the work and in, in the in the in the way we are working. But coming back to the interest rate against real estate investments, obviously um, we hear this since uh, at least I hear this roughly since 10 years that interest rates will pick up. Um, I think part of our industry here is more not only concentrate will this be a complementary good or. A Will this be another type of investment that um, is it interest rate or is it real estate? So when you look at, you said it, <coughs> I was a bit surprised that um, the German investors are so heavily um, close to over allocation. Because looking at global numbers, um, the institutional investors are rather under allocated, I think roughly 30%. And if it's 20, it doesn't matter. But you have here a highly fragmented industry all over the place with interesting mega trends, with interesting new products. And I think it's a job of us here on the asset management side to provide the products, to institutionalize the products, to follow the mega trends. I found this very interesting with the data center, something we don't do. 
Um, but we started this whole micro living service apartments and you're absolutely right it's about the operator so that means if you find the right product for your client it will always be a share that I'm convinced in the investment portfolio of our clients of sovereign wealth funds of the of the Germans and it's uh, it's about the product so and then even if rates come up which I personally don't I don't know it but I also don't expect it I expect it slight coming up in the next years, but even if we close the gap a bit, real estate will be a, a, a preferred allocation because it's real, as the name says, and it will be part of the portfolio. And then, obviously, the asset managers will win, uh, who by then are the preferred partner of all these <coughs> institutional currently uh, under allocated, under invested clients. Um, I wanted to pick up a little bit um, just on, um, m maybe let's, let's start with you, Nathan, on this. Um, I mean, one of the interesting things is that probably all of last year, political risk was a, was a huge part of the discussion. You know, almost sometimes a quarter, a third of the discussion would be about Trump, would be about Brexit, would be about politics, would be about all manner of things. And of course, you can never separate economics and, and politics uh, completely. We have seen at 9-11 what impact uh, kind of, of terror uh, acts can have on, on uh, international economics. Um, but let's point a little bit on, on German national politics, which also have a big impact on, on what's happening on the real estate market. Um, I think uh, in the big picture, Germany is and will stay uh, a hotspot for international uh, investors. Um, but somehow what frightens me when it comes to residential uh, real estate is that the federal government and also the Berlin state government are creating a kind of an unfriendly investors atmosphere in Germany, spreading rumors about confiscation, about uh, freeze uh, of rentals, um, and creating a kind of a crisis which uh, possibly does not exist this way. Uh, as Thomas said, reality and sen sensitivity is not always uh, the same. And it's not, the, it's not the way that we have in our big seven cities, people living on the street because there are no uh, sufficient apartment uh, capacities. We have a lack of affordable apartments. Uh, this is the problem, but uh, the amount of apartments is, is big enough. And when you're talking um, about freeze of rentals, you create an image that the government wishes to solve the problem for one group on the expense of another group. And you don't really solve the problem because if you freeze the rentals, you have the same amount of total apartments. You don't change anything. And how can you guarantee that those people who are really, really in need of affordable apartments will get them? Because the landlords are not uh, uh, required to rent out um, freezed, rented freezed apartments to those who really need them. So this is the completely wrong approach and it's creating a kind of unsecureness and a kind of, of uh, not good feeling for international investors because they don't know where this is going to end. I mean, um, in terms of politics, I'm a bit... Um, Skeptical because I think we, we if you're all honest, we live in a in a massive bubble. Um, you you all probably travel five or German cities, and then you might travel some other five to ten global cities, and you know your way around. You know the best restaurants, hotels, blah blah blah. <laughs> you, you 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 happily enter skyscrapers, and it's just normal for you. Um, and I think um, that's that's our reality, but that's by far not the reality of like the, the, the people in, 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 in this country. So and I think by doing so, we left big parts behind, not that they are poor or live on the street, but they, they feel, and that's AFD or Brexit, whatever it comes from, that the people who work as well kind of have the feeling that they are being left behind. So it's a, it's a major problem in my eyes, which we should, I mean, possibly not in this room, but we should be tackled could be the, the social democrats but they're not doing it um but oh, that that can be a threat a, a real one i think as well as we see brexit is i mean is a real threat to the uk economy at least for the european one as well so it can go further trump is the same so i'm a bit skeptical in that, that regard i agree and um but interesting is what do you make out of that as an asset manager so when you look at um how 
demographics have changed. Exactly what you are saying. You can go into the hotel, but that's not the normal life. This is basically what you are saying. So we started, when we started with uh, student apartments 10 years ago, we discovered 30% are non-students anymore in our apartments. So we looked at all the different generations from the silence to the now to the younger generation set and then you start structuring products for these specific uh, target groups. So therefore I totally share your view mm -hmm. but as an asset manager that's also a huge opportunity because you start diggling exactly into these uh, uh, things. So we concentrate absolute uh, on the top seven cities and on the global cities when it comes to student apartments, when it comes to micro living and it takes years to develop that and we had this discussion you're absolutely right you need your own operator and this is what we have done and with our it was also an opportunity it's another it's another opportunities which we started 2009 post financial crisis with our mass financing right i mean we financed meanwhile close to 40,000 units in the top seven cities so um i think we all have a huge responsibility when it comes to solving these problems because the politicians you absolutely right they will not do it they try to do it and I think it will help our industry even because they have to provide rental caps that all these things are nice but they have to provide at the end of the day land plots in the top seven cities or top 15 cities where people can't afford living anymore but this is why when you look at the list from from Thomas um, on the top 10 asset classes, you're right, I don't know, 80% or so is exactly this issue, that people can't afford living anymore in, in these cities, right? It was, yes, I mean, on the slide, I think it was seven out of the top 10 yeah. were all related to residential in some form or another, um, which was very interesting, I thought. Um, Tobias, in, in, you're obviously focused a, a lot more on the on the smaller cities. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, maybe pick up that point from Nathan there about uh, are the investors that you're talking to are they concerned about um, regulatory changes in Germany? It certainly came up um, in um, the UK when we were when we did the German investment briefing there. It was an element of, of concern um, and was raised actually also by the head of capital markets for. For Collius, who was on the panel, as one of the specific things that he was being asked about at the moment, and it was also mentioned in Stockholm um, as as to whether or not, admittedly, this was in the Nordics by the Nordics deciding whether or not they were really the safe haven in Europe, not Germany. Um, <laughs> but um, how how do you see that, and also just how do you see the the sort of the, the kind of smaller cities at the moment? Well, the first part of your question, the regulatory things, um, I don't have too much of discussion with my clients or investors, but maybe due to the fact that, that we focus on commercial real estate where we don't have this, this discussion. But just as an example, um, as, as you said, um, that you focus on the top seven cities um, for student micro-living. Um, I was in Nordhorn yesterday, which is a city of 50,000 people in, in Niedersachsen. Um, they have a, an average rent of, uh, for residential of five euros, and newly built are below 8 euros per square meter. So compare this to construct construction costs, then you know where the problem is. Uh, you don't have the rents um, to yet to pay construction costs. You, and I'm not talking about buying the piece of land. That's still on top of it. So this, this is the, the, the big part of the problem. And uh, the second part of your question and is, was... Is that regulated rents or is that just... No, no, that's, 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 that's free market rent. Yeah. So actually it doesn't pay to build these new... Yeah, it, it does not. And uh, if there's some some apartments built, they are usually sold to to the to the owner occupier, and there's almost no no rental buildings who are newly built in in the and that's I would say comparable to to the vast majority of, of uh, the, the smaller cities in Germany. Um, and looking particularly <coughs> at the commercial sectors, which which sectors are people looking at? Where are you finding? Traction from international buyers in in, in the German in the small cities. Well, since since we started um, buying real estate <coughs> in our own book uh, th two years ago, we focus on on, on the smaller cities, starting from thirty thousand citizens upwards. Um, we like to go into commercial areas in these cities and buy multi-let office and, uh, and warehouse buildings. And we have a lot of uh, interest from say smaller German family offices, but also from some of the, I would call them typical uh, or usual suspects from, from the private equity business. Um, coming out of London, um, for <coughs> Asian or uh, Arab investors, um, this approach is too small because they like tickets um, in a three-digit million range. 
um, my properties start at two million and go up to, to six, seven million. So it's it's small tickets per per asset, but the idea is to grow it into a, a portfolio which is spread nationwide and then um, yeah keep it in the long term. And, and therefore, for for this type of product, I I see an increasing interest. Um, the answer to why is that? So is yeah, I have two answers. The first is um, just to find a new type of property which is not yet institutionalized. And um, on the other side is you, you have a comparable risk uh, scheme to, to multi-let family buildings because I don't buy single-let buildings. Um, I, pr I prefer buildings which have um, at least 10 to at least 10 tenants. So if one tenant leaves, you don't have a um, a problem like with a, a discount market where the lease um, runs out and you have 100% of cash that's gone because when some tenant leaves with 5% of the income then you already have a, a dip but not a problem. <laughs> that's okay, good. good. Um, and uh, Nathan, you're, as well as the very good job you're doing at, um, at PwC Legal, you're also, um, you're linked into um, the, uh, the Israeli investors particularly. Um, it would be interesting just to get your perception of, of what they're looking at when they're investing here especially. What, what are they looking for? What are they interested in, in your experience? I don't think that uh, Israeli investors are much different than other <laughs> international or domestic investors. They are looking for a safe uh, infrastructure uh, relating to uh, the legal infrastructure and the economic economical <coughs> uh, infrastructure. And here Germany is and will stay, as I said before. Uh, a very interesting, uh, interesting uh, target. Um, uh, Israeli pension funds are looking for opportunities to invest. Uh, capital markets and interest are staying very low. So, so every investment uh, which gives a yield uh, above three percent or three point five percent is very interesting, and not only to Israeli investors. Um, and Lars, just from your perspective as well. Um, one of the things that's been coming up a, a, a great deal in general across Europe when we've been doing these sessions is just availability of product. Um, how do you see that at the moment and how do you see that influencing the, the sectors that you're in? Yeah, you're absolutely right. We have six, a pipeline of six billion um, across all our asset classes. So, But our main asset class is residential and micro-living. So that's 50% of our portfolio that we are managing. We are managing currently 26 billion of assets under management. So that's huge. And availability of product, micro-living, we could do much more. So we have competition from clients who want to invest into this product. Why? You have a clear um, demand a uh, higher demand than supply obviously because you need to build them and you need to have your own operator. So that means even the big asset manager businesses that are much bigger than us um, don't usually don't have their own operators which we have uh, developed and where we are definitely not there where we want to be but we will get there uh, in the last 10 years. So this takes, so it's like a hotel, you can have a beautiful hotel but if you don't have the operator it will not going to work. And the um, requirements from the, from the clients, so from the either, say, the typical business manager, they want to have their micro apartments stuffed like hotels. They are a bit cheaper, though they are very demanding, and also from students. I mean, in Germany, you have a very high, obviously, fragmentation when it comes to students, a very low supply of student accommodations, and most of that, more than 60%, is in the public hands. And we all know from our days when we started how these look like. This is not like the students uh, prefer today. But this is a huge chance. So when you have the product, you can be very certain that you find your client. If it's domestic, if it's Asian, it doesn't matter. We will roll this out. We are market leader in the micro-living segment. So in the independent uh, uh, from the public hands. Uh, and we will ro definitely roll this out in Europe. And we see loads of demands from Asia, you're right but uh, also from Europe, in all fairness, because it's yielding more, so you get 50 to 100 basis points more than in residential, even in established market markets. So when you go, uh, say, to Poland, you get 7 8% yields. It's highly attractive. And uh, everything you said, um, I can underpin in combination, by the way, the first question you asked, uh, with sustainability. That's the next big thing. So. A year ago, or two years ago, when I served with Corus Day, this was a this was a discussion. Do you have it today? It's a must. Uh, 
So if you don't have a clear ESG strategy that is public, we will publish it actually in the next two weeks on our <coughs> website, and we spend a year now into that with clear targets. 30% of all CO2 emissions are produced by real estate. That's amazing. So what the clients want to see is in social, environmental and governance that you provide targets which are measurable, which are transparent. Otherwise, you will not get there. So we start, for instance, another thing um, uh, in due uh, uh, course, our first in-ref reporting. Uh, two or three years ago, that was nobody thought about that in Germany, in particular the smaller asset managers. And these investments, this is the real economies of scale that you can drive in larger organizations. That's, by the way, for me, the only reason to grow uh, such companies. It's not just to, so to say, increase the AUMs, but the client simply wants to have product, he wants all the ESG, and otherwise he will not survive. But that's, on the other hand, a big opportunity. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, the industry overlooked mega trends, and um, that is an opportunity for some who can do better. And real estate is a product, it's not just boring bricks and mortar. And um, you can, I, I fully agree, pop, uh, maybe come to we work in, in a minute, but it's like, can you, you can have we live or we care or whatever, um, you can call it whatever you want to, they, 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 they pay significant rents for just a table because it's nice and trendy and people would do the same for living and senior care, whatever is on the list, I totally agree. It's, it's a product, it's a platform, it's a brand, can be linked to the internet, whatever to kind of, it's like customers and not only think that you, you throw money in and you don't care about for the next 20 years. Yeah, I think work. this has changed exactly. In the past, real estate was you buy the core office, um, markets get tighter, so you need new concepts. And this is where all the smaller, as core estate was three years ago, the smaller asset managers <coughs> distinguish from the larger asset managers. But the problem is, you have your good product and the large investors, the institutional <coughs> investors, will never buy from a small asset manager in today's world because as a small asset manager, you have, uh, you're lacking ESG, you're lacking your reporting standards, transparency, all these things. And when you combine this, then you can, you don't only do me too, as the, so to say, as the big, big ones, which we, of course, <coughs> uh, do not compete. But this is uh, an opportunity we saw the last years we will invest further. It's quite interesting also to see, I mean, the um, wellness and well-being and well-certification um, is a sort of new area um, that's been growing. And we had Rachel Gutter, who's the president of that from the US, was on one of our panels at MIPIM. Um, and that was a very interesting insight. And then later on, um, the first well-certified building in CEE came out in Prague and Prologis did a well-certified logistics um, centre um, in in the Netherlands, and I'm pretty convinced that if I'd have even attempted to have a discussion about whether or not a logistics building would be well certified, it would have just been regarded as completely ridiculous. Um, but it, it's an interesting trend driven by the requirement, I think, to have the right talent in the right place. So, do you? I mean, this is to anybody as well. Do you see that as something that's um, already here as a trend in Germany or something that's beginning to, to, to pick up? When I said two years ago it was the first time asked, this was actually in the Nordics. So I think in Germany we are far behind that, in all fairness. And um, we heavily invested into this. We were, we were, as I said, we will launch our first digital ESG report. I give you one example. We will we commit ourselves, and I think actually two or three years ago that would have been everybody would have laughed. Uh, we commit ourselves to reduce CO2 and waste production until 2025 by uh, um, uh, uh, 20 percent. Uh, right. and, and first of all, in our whole portfolio. So that means you need systems, processes, IT that is measurable. How much do we produce? But again. Um, this is not my ambitious fantasy, this is what the client wants. It's very strict and therefore I think coming to your question, I think that's the beginning and um, mm. who is not following will, uh, <coughs> will, will not to continue to be successful in this market. And let's pick up the, uh, the WeWorking part. I mean, uh, I, I've got a couple of questions and I'm, I'm going to come to those now actually. Um, so first, which is a, was a quick one which I quite like, which is, is it a good time to launch German REITs? 
in brackets again. Um, I mean, interesting, interesting to see mentioned in your Thomas. Obviously, in the in the U.S., a lot of the, the success um, of the sort of um, the living type data centers that you know that be, that's because they've listed those. Um, that, you know, they're listed REITs who are who are doing that. Um, what's the sense here? Is there is it is it time for that? Is it time for for German REITs again? So, I think 10 years ago, yeah. we were in Berlin with my former employer, and unfortunately it's what you said, the politicians are not yes. in favor. So making money with real estate is always, it's always a bit a touch of a negative sentiment, so I really start, uh, started then to, to leave this by the side, because in particular when it comes to residential, um, I think it will, I don't know, you have more experience there maybe, but uh, for the politician side it's difficult. Uh, to get this. No, I, I agree, it makes sense, but the legal concept, I mean, yes, it's 10 years or more, and we all discussed the concept and we were certain that it didn't, wouldn't work what they set up, and it didn't work, so it's like, what is it, three and a half reads? Um, <laughs> so one pre-read and three reads, I, the concept doesn't work, but yeah, in theory it would work because the open-ended fund system is a bit unreal because it's long-term assets and short-term investments into it, so it did. It, that's a misconcept. Still, we have these operators, and the, the remaining ones are successful, remain successful. So we won't get there. So we won't get a German REIT. I, I don't see it happening at all. I can imagine that um, REITs they work, but not in Germany. Um, but I see more and more interest from um, investors that are interested in, in, in doing blockchain investments. Uh, like uh, we have seen Peakside, who just initiated their first um, vehicle by by using a, a Berlin-based um, startup. And um, <coughs> when you look at it, to me, this is uh, the, the new form of, of what we called geschlossene Immobilien for a couple of years ago. You, you can invest into real estate with much lower cost, um, but you can, as a, as a private investor, you can spend um, a small amount of money and be co-owner of uh, whatever type of property you want to, to own. That, I think that's much more interesting than having a, a German REIT Okay. Again, um, also in the in the London one, where we had the CEO from the Singapore Stock Exchange, one of the things that he was particularly um, saying was that there was more of an interest um, from Singapore-based investors uh, who wanted access to European and particularly German real estate, um, but were comfortable through a listed route. That um, there was, in his view, there was a particular desire for German portfolios to list as an exit on the Singapore Stock Exchange because they would get a better, you, they, they would generally get a better um, net asset value than they would do by listing um, in Europe, which was just an interesting way of looking at it, I thought. Um, let, let's pick up that, that, that other big trend of, of co-working because that also came up as a question, so thank you for that, which is, um, one, how do we see that developing, I guess, would be interesting. I mean, we're, th there's a a relatively new one in the building downstairs. Um, I think you know you've got. I can't remember what the the. It's a it's a huge part of the London market, huge part of the Manhattan market. Um, so how do we see that developing? Is it really sustainable? And um, the question here also was, um, when rental demand <coughs> goes down, will these operators suffer, or will they potentially benefit because they? Um, have more flexibility, you know, how strong is that model, I suppose? I mean, I'm not, I'm biased because I work for WeWork, but um, <laughs> so it's probably honest to say that. And, uh, <laughs> other um, suppliers are available. <laughs> there's other, there's other, that are good. I, I think the first thing is, I mean, that, that office here and, um, is three years old and we had to take another floor, which is floor 10 or half of it. Um, and when doing so, I, I asked the architect, and I wasn't involved in, in that project here, so I'm biased as well, possibly. Um, I said, okay, can we make a, a, the space a bit more modern, fresher, new, and can we try something? It's a relatively small floor, and can, <coughs> can we try new, open, fresh concepts? That, and then I asked the second question, that match into the existing concept? And he said, yes, we can do a modern, new concept, but we can't make it match into this one here. Um, so <laughs> that's basically, it's like, it's, and that's brand new and people did their best when doing it. 
Um, but the, the, the trend or the, the world changed so dramatically over the last three years that all we did like four, five years ago in best, in, with best intention <laughs> is, is like old and dated. So, so we did something brand new, which looks indeed like a WeWork, and then people were internally, especially partners, tend to be a bit older, so they were skeptical, can that work? Do people really want to work there? And yes, only HR, BD, and like the, 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 the support functions were happy to, to take on board, but now everybody wants to be on the 10th floor, <laughs> and we only have one, ten, uh, one floor number 10. So I think things have changed dramatically, and if you talk we work and the, the new brand is uh, headquarters by we work because it started with like the, the uh, people with the dogs and drinking blah 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 so the, the berlin uh, hipsters um, but it's now the big companies who kind of take the big spaces so it's the bmws the banks and they go in and take like two thousand three thousand four thousand even more uh, a thousand square meters from we work or design offices just because they, they first want the flexibility, but I think more importantly, they want that product because they want the talent and the people want to work there. So it has changed dramatically. All the offices that exist are just dated. And I think even if the downturn comes, that flexibility drives uh, uh, tenants and demand into these spaces. And I think that the, that the, the real competition for these, these operators can be on the long run, and hopefully that, that will change the market, that, that the normal offices will be, become an upgrade as well, also in terms of the living, so that's the real threat. However, these guys develop, so they develop into platforms, so you can, you can use your mobile device to enter the office, to order, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's like that convenience that comes along, which you're completely missing in all the other um, areas. So it's it's a mega trend. It's it's super powerful. They develop quickly. So it's really something for the the, the, the more classic um, real, estate in, real estate industry to catch up. Otherwise, it might be like the German car industry that, 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 that was, was in a very good shape and suddenly Tesla is there. Yes, the Tesla is maybe not a BMW, but still, people like it. It's it's the only e-car for time being. So it, it's a real threat. Hmm? When when I look at, at WeWork and, and all the, the this this hype for for shared work, uh, this reminds me of what we had um, before the um, new economy bubble um, burst some 20 years ago. Um, their hype, WeWork is valued almost 50 billion euros, but um, they don't earn any money. And um, I ask myself, how how can this work? Um, how can this be a sustainable approach? My personal um, yeah, feeling is that this will be comparable to what we had some 20 years ago with all these serviced office um, operators. We had a lot of them, but now it's, it seems to me that we only have Regis and one or two others. And when we, the downturn comes, when, whenever it comes, uh, I'm sure that a lot of these shared um, office um, um, operators, they, they will just leave the market. And at the end, some of the biggers may survive. If it's WeWork, of uh, course, fingers for you, um, but um, I don't know. I'm skeptical. I'm absolutely agreeing, and that comes back to the point: you have to invest, you have to build up your operator, you need a certain size. Again, it's like uh, everybody can build um, a student home or a WeWork, but sustainability is about: do you really can offer the service the client wants long term? And um, that uh, only because it's a you are, it's a trend now, yes. And it will continue, and it will continue in particular with the new generations, right? We will in ten years, we will sit here. They will say you are old, old people, in your old they offices. They already say that. But they <laughs> already say this now. And when you go into offices in Berlin ten years ago, there, I think there it started actually, and now you see it here uh, at Linklater's down there. It's amazing. So and um, but I, I think uh, um, yeah, a very diligent. Um, building up very diligent operations on that, and then you have big chances uh, to win this battle. Um, let's, let's have a look at some of the other, some of the other sectors as well. Um, let's pick up a little bit on that, uh, your specialism there, um, which is that, that the sort of micro-living. Um, what are the trends there? And because you're also developing, I think, in Spain as well, mm -hmm. and uh, are there trends that you're seeing in the different markets that are developing differently to Germany? Uh, yes, but we concentrate obviously on these markets also in Europe where we have a clear undersupply when it comes to in particular student apartments. So the Bologna protocol helps here. So that means students um, uh, need and want uh, to, to study abroad. 
and they are not prepared to, to, to live anymore in these student apartments that are not that high standard as uh, what, what private operators serve. So interesting is the one thing you can say, you build up the student apartment, the other thing is what the investors want, right? And at the end of the day, the investor want to have some certain yields. Uh, you have developed markets like Germany, <coughs> it's fragmented, but it's more developed, I would call, than, uh, for instance, Ireland. Right, so therefore, or Poland, as I said in the beginning, there you see fantastic yield, seven, eight percent, for a product which you can assess. The only uh, unbekannte uncertainty is uh, the operator, and there, in all fairness, uh, we are all pretty new in this market. So I think nobody can say I've done this the last twenty years. Uh, we have developed it the last ten years, but a real larger operation that takes a bit of time. Um, in Spain, you're right, there we have three projects, Madrid, Valencia, Sevilla, a huge interest from uh, international investors. And what do these investors want? They want to do an, a comprehensive Spanish strategy. And what do we follow out of that? Uh, we will look now in certain areas in Europe to basically to duplicate that. And the first two questions really the, the investor has, how is your track record in your operations? Uh, and how is your uh, sustainability strategy, right? Because you can be, what they don't like is uh, to invest uh, triple digit uh, <laughs> millions um, in operators which exist not uh, in five years anymore. Because they underwrite with you a 10 years business plan. So this all goes hand in hand. But when you look at the pure research, we will come out with the research during the year there, um, mm -hmm. and simply look, okay, which demands in which European <laughs> legislations you have. So the very basic numbers, the amount of students, the amount of beds. And then when you anticipate that times have changed, students are more demanding, they want to have more flexibility. They need more flexibility in the term of living as we need in the term of working, right? And um, this is what we capture there. Okay, good. Um, I, I wanted to pick up with you, Tobias, as well, just in terms of some of the the locations. Obviously, it's now been as long since the wall went up, um, and Germany was divided between east and west. Uh, the wall has now been down as long as it was up previously. Um, how, because you're looking at those smaller cities, we've seen Leipzig, Dresden, uh, Berlin, I guess, do doing well and growing. Um, how are you seeing the demand, I suppose, for the smaller cities, uh, the B and C cities, um, what was previously West Germany and, um, and previously East Germany? Is, is there a dramatic difference or do you see growth on both sides? Well, in terms of, from the investor's perspective, there's almost no interest in, in the B, and, uh, B, C or, or even D cities um, for commercial properties. There's some... Um, exceptions to the rule, but um, at the bottom line there, there's almost no interest. When you look at residential, th that's a to total picture, but um, that, since we focus on commercial, um, I cannot say too much about this um, part of our market. Um, but in terms of looking at commercial real estate, as I just mentioned, in smaller units and in smaller cities, I don't see a massive difference between um, cities like Norton or um, Chemnitz or Erfurt. Um, as long as the, the, the demographics and, um, are okay, you can invest, invest there as well. I mean, we, we, funny, funny enough, you, uh, we discussed, we pre-discussed that panel, and uh, I was talking East East Germany, and kind of, and a day later uh, on Spiegel Online, there was that that uh, information on the population in East in Germany. You've probably seen that that they are at the numbers of 1905 now. Um, which is shocking, whilst in the, in the meantime the population in Western Germany has doubled. So I think, and that <coughs> trend continues, so, and that's, that's actually AFD territory again as well, because these people are being left behind every day. And there's, they, I, I think, yes, we, we, can, we can focus on, on Dresden and Leipzig and Berlin, and, and that's absolutely necessary, because the, you, there needs to be something in the area at least, but the rest is, is basically no go territory, and and it's it's lost, and it probably cannot be changed because population in these regions is is aging. You can't stop it, so there will be hardly any population left in terms of investment. That's clear. You can't invest there. The the only thing, the only responsibility probably the state has is to kind of upkeep the infrastructure. Um, 
it's it's really sad. But that's not only in Germany, but but in, in, in like all other parts of Europe as well. It's the same in France, the same in England. Um, and, and I wonder, in um, Thomas, I don't know if you, I, I haven't got a chance to look now, but um, just that top ten cities was very interesting. That Berlin, out of the German cities, was very much at the top. Um, if we went back five years ago, would it have been the, would it have even been in the top ten? I don't know. I think ten years, <coughs> ten years ago, it was not in the top ten, but the last three to four years, it was always number one. Right. Okay. It just flipped down to number two because there was no no availability of of, of assets and its uh, investors said it's too expensive so let's focus on other areas like Lisbon yeah. but you can't really compare <coughs> the market as Lisbon is pretty small yeah. but yes it's a it's a trend um, yeah as I said Berlin it was n number one for quite a while um, but ten years ago it was not there I mean it's quite interesting just because from from the UK but also from other areas where we've gone Berlin is consistently talked about more than any other German city and it's almost as if there's an expectation that there will be London, Paris, Berlin, that it will be that kind of size and influence city, but that's never the impression that I get when I'm in Germany, um, which, is, which is interesting, so it'll be interesting to see who is, who's right. Um, is there a sense just on the panel here of that perception of Berlin? changing that because obviously you've had a federal city of you know federal federal system for a long time where the cities are relatively evenly sized but i guess in berlin's favor there is actually room to develop there which is more more difficult in the other cities but but how do we see that i think it's different <coughs> of course from a people who lives not in germany um, because it's difficult always to explain how fragmented um, how spread germany is mean um, you're saying Paris, London, Berlin and if you look at the countries that can't be in reality because you have in France Paris and you have in the UK London but in uh, Germany you have um, I don't know 180 cities more than 50,000 inhabitants and when you look at the GDP socioeconomic data on gross cities you find middle uh, how you say um, middle große Städte um, medium-sized medium cities uh, that have fantastic growth and that was actually where we went uh, in yeah, seven, eight years ago to buy smaller high street assets. Today we have a portfolio of two billion. You are right, the sentiment has changed yes, because of the US and you said all the arguments but um, just to, I'm always, I, I, I grew up in Berlin and I always thought it's a great city, but there is no, there are no huge uh, companies who provide jobs. So rents and everything went up, values went up, but at the end of the day, all the, um, how you say, the economic power is fragmented in Germany. <coughs> when you see how much of the GDP is produced in these 180 cities I was talking about, that is very, very stable. Um, now Berlin has changed with our fintech and all these industry, luckily. So now the values went up and now economic drivers comes, so to say, was lacking and is coming. And um, yeah, so, and what, what happens on the residential side in Berlin is completely mad, obviously. Um, also driven by, poli by, by mistakes by the government years ago. And now we see the result, it's terrible. Um, it's investor unfriendly, I share this view, absolutely. Um, so, but at the end of the day, as we do all in this industry, and we have to do, it is a bit equilibrium, right? So if people go on the street, uh, I think some of the larger um, property holding company are doing this very well now to balance this, right? There were years just uh, 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 yield, 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 and obviously it's a, now it's a, it's, a, it's a top topic in the, uh, whole society, um, and we have to we have to react. Otherwise, uh, we will not be sustainable in this industry. And uh, in terms of that regulation, um, Carsten, as far as you see that, does that just affect the residential to rent area, or does that also uh, impact on student housing, on micro living, on some of these niche sectors that are obviously growing? I mean, for time being. It does not um, legally does not impact impact anything, but um, and it's to be seen whether it will. Um, 
become kind of reality. It will certainly not have an impact on other commercial models uh, such as uh, co-living, whatever, because these are different concepts. I can't see that being um, applied to it. Um, what they could do is really cap the, the rents for a certain time, or they could, um, and, 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 and that's something that's, for example, done in, in Munich for 30 years, um, and the city could say, okay, in that area we cap the rents, or and we exercise preemption rights, which they can always do if they if they have to set it up and running, and they say, okay, we, if you sell it, we either buy it or you accept our terms, which city of Munich does, but city of Munich has money um, to to do something, so so um, and to act, um, Berlin doesn't. So I I, I I I don't know what the concept might be. I think for the time being it's political propaganda basically and they should face reality that it was the city and the state, whatever, they sold the, the apartments themselves and now they complain of, uh, about it. Um, basically I think the stock is in a better shape than it was 10 years ago So uh, and yes, people want a return for it. And on top of things, the city and the state, they have land so if they want to in kind of get going, they should kind of, in my eyes, set up joint ventures with people who know how to build and operate real estate, and then they should attribute um, the land to it, and I say, okay, that's that's what we do, it's social living, uh, what, what has been done years and years before, it wasn't wasn't wrong, and as I'm in, v in Vienna, it works well, so that's something that the city should do instead of kind of going back to the old communist times, say, okay, we take it away from the people who paid for it, it doesn't work. And I was in um, Amsterdam last week at Pravada, um, and there they've got a very aggressive target that they've said, well, aggressive is maybe the wrong word, but they've got a, a very high target for the number of houses that they want to produce. And so the government and the city regions are very actively working with investors about how you put those houses in the right places where they're needed with an understanding that the rents are quite different, and so you've got to find a way around it. Um, but they're, they're being very active on that. Um, I just wanted to touch a little bit on um, some of the things also that were in Thomas's, particularly retail. Um, interesting to see the, the, the rent levels and the yield levels weren't you know, changing dramatically. Um, is that just because of the way it's, it's looked at here? Um, or do we, you know, how, how do you see those playing out? Is it something that's only going to be for the larger centres, or is there also opportunity in the smaller cities? What's what's the sense of, of retail, dead or alive? Um, dead, uh, fully alive. I, I'd like to de I'd like to declare an interest, having just launched a magazine called Living Retail. But then that's <laughs> No, but I think it's about the locations, it's about the concepts, it's about that many, why have these uh, medium-sized cities grown? Because people moved away, can't afford anymore living in the top 10, 15 cities. It's, it's too expensive, so they start moving around. Um, they love to shop in the internet, of course, uh, but they also love to go with their families uh, in the Palestinian areas during the weekend. Very simple speaking, you want, and this is also what we capture in WeWork, in the whole co-living, it's about community. You want to exchange. Uh, our kids, they don't want to, like we did it in these small offices, just 14 hours a day work. They want to communicate work-life balance, well-being. When we heard this 10 years ago, first time, we thought it's just nice words, but that's the reality we are facing today. And therefore, if the economy is strong in Germany, which is still strong, um, and you have the backbone of the German industry in the German medium-sized cities and you calibrate the retail in the right spaces, so obviously in the big, uh, uh, big out-of-town shopping centers, I'm um, very skeptical, but the nice areas, I'm talking Münster, Offenburg, Lübeck, where you, where you love to walk with your family through, I think that will continue. Interesting, as I said, we have two billions uh, placed, one billion with one of the largest asset manager um, pension funds in Germany. Uh, they are yielding five and a half, six percent. They are led 95 percent. It's highly diversified. If one tenant goes and comes, it doesn't matter at the end. The main importance is backbone in the, in the German economy. And as long as you don't make their wrong investment decisions, <coughs> it can work. Diversification, 
and in the in the right economy. I wouldn't do this in, in other countries, obviously. Okay, and in the smaller cities as well, is that is, is how do you see retail there? There's nothing to add. What last is that? Um, There's been a lot of agreement on this. Good. Um, are there any questions that anybody has to ask from here? If so, raise your hands now. I'm going to count mentally down to five, but in fact, I don't need to. Christiana, yes. <laughs> I would just like to confirm what Lars said about sustainability ESG. That's also what we see at PwC. Um, and But also from a legislative perspective, we have so ambitious climate protection targets in Germany and in the European Union. So we expect more, more tighter legislation on ESG, let it be CO2 tax or reporting standards. It's most likely there will be a definition on, on green buildings and what it actually means and what a green fund is and what green financing means. Okay, good. We saw in the past 15 years a professionalization and institutionalization of this real estate business, right? I mean, when you look at the uh, at market caps of all the holding companies and therefore the governance and everything around that, what in other industries is absolute standards, we have to catch up. And the good thing is there's room for everyone because we are so, so we are so at the starting point, I would call it. When we sit here in 10 years, it's a complete different game. Um, and quickly, I wanted to pick up on, because also in Thomas's slides, one of the ones at the end was the, the MES funding side, which you touched upon as well. Um, is that, I mean, obviously, you've picked up on the, on that trend. Do you see an increasing demand for that? How how does that fit in? Is that purely for development, or or what's the strategy there? So we started this post financial crisis because banking, the normal say, or not the normal, the banks who have a, uh, access to the covered mortgage bond market, fund brief uh, license, they are kept say around fifty percent in developments, and therefore. To build up all these flats in Germany, somebody needs to finance it. And that's when we stepped in. So we are providing the mezzanine capital for these, uh, in particular, residential home buildings. And uh, is there a trend uh, that, that the business is simply, of course, it's booming because the government, we all know this, we have a shortage of housing in Germany. We have a shortage of housing also due to regulation because they can't finance it since the financial crisis. Um, also in Europe, so in other in other countries, uh, but in particular in Germany, obviously you all know this. Um, the government wants to build up to 1.5 million new flats until 2021. That's a huge number. Of course, we will not get it, but again, somebody needs to finance, and this is when we come into play. I think one distinctive factor, as with the operator, it's not about money left to right. It's about having the development expertise. We came from the development business in that subsidiary and then suddenly saw, wow, nobody is giving us the other, the delta between the equity and the senior loan. And that's when we started this business. And um, Tobias, for you, are your investors normally requiring finance or is it, is it pure equity? <laughs> and how easy is it for them to be able to get finance if they need it in, in the sort of B and C cities? Well, um, now talking as an agent, my investors, they usually pay 100% equity, which was some 10 years ago, this, this was a, a USP, but nowadays it's just um, the usual thing. But we are talking about, say, core, core plus properties um, where, yeah, these investors, <coughs> family offices, um, the usual suspects from Germany, they, they usually pay full equity. But now talking as an, as an joint venture investor, last year we bought a, a, a value add property in Bochum, where we thought about um, using mezzanine capital, but um, we got so good um, debt from, from, a, from a bank. Like we talk about 90% <coughs> LTV for a development scheme. Um, that was, my, my partners, they, they just couldn't believe it when they saw the term sheet. Um, but also this is also more or less a usual thing. 
I can confirm what uh, Tobias said. Also, uh, our clients are in, um, um, are uh, funding more and more with equity, their own equity. But I think this is the reason because there is a lack of opportunities and a decrease of opportunities. So the capital reserved for more deals uh, is on the accounts and can be spent on one deal completely in order to uh, to uh, spend money for interest or mezzanine capital. Maybe one thing to differentiate. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I give you one example. We are financing here the Polizei Presidium in Frankfurt, right? There you have a senior loan, 100 million roughly, and you have a mass piece, 100 million from us roughly. So all I'm saying, larger projects, and now it comes to a, a wider strategy, obviously. That means when you also want to develop larger schemes in residential then I'm talking some hundred units, right? Who's doing this? We don't have, like you in the UK or in the US, uh, the large development stock listed companies, right? So that means um, uh, access to capital is key there. The government has to provide the land plots. The senior banks provide the senior loan. We provide the mezzanine. Uh, actually, first quarter last uh, this year, it was the most successful Ever we have in this business, and of course, because the product is needed to be built, we need more homes in Germany, and someone has to finance this. Smaller tickets, I'm absolutely with you. That's uh, that's something banks obviously doing. But when we're talking some fifty hundred millions, it's a different it's a different game. Thank you, good. Any yes, go ahead. Yeah. And question probably to Larsen. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned is uh, niches, and I think one niche still is logistic, and there's a very funny animal, and that's last mile logistics, right? Now, everybody's talking about last mile logistics. What is last mile logistics, right? Because um, I think, especially in the UK, uh, we had investors that were looking um, very intensely to spend hundreds of millions in, in Germany on last mile logistics. And if you speak to those guys, what exactly are you looking for? Well, one thing's pretty clear, it's not the last mile, right? <laughs> because it seems to be close to townish, right? Uh, we were looking at a space in, in Hamburg, in a St. Georg area, that even was commercial space, it was 2,000 square meters. We wanted to kind of convert this into logistic space. Well, and what happened was that the municipality said, no guys, because what is going to happen is you have your trucks 100 a day coming, and we don't want this, right? So um, I think still it is interesting. The question is, what kind of product is this? And um, conceptually, this would be something that you could create scale with. But um, it's very difficult to find whatever you want to use of it, or where are you going to find the assets? Is that anything that you're looking at? Thomas, w what is last mile logistics? Hold that thought for a second, because I'll take there was a question at the back as well. And then, yeah. My question is um, <coughs> the property price is going up, but um, we have seen the share <laughs> price of uh, Costco has been coming down in the last uh, 10 months. Do you have any words on, on, on the share price development? So probably we've seen property prices rising, but the share price of the property companies has been dropping. Yes. Interesting. Okay, so two points there. First of all, logistics last mile. And you're, <laughs> yeah. you're right, there is a bit on, but in fairness, you're not <laughs> so, so I can talk to you about that, but, but I won't. Let's. let's uh, does anybody want to pick up the, the logistics bit? Not much. Yeah, can I, I, I can, Christian, I can agree that um, I also talked to a large private equity player here in Germany who are also looking at a European last mile logistic strategy. And after six months, it was the same comment, uh, what is it really? So at the end of the day, it's something where you get your lo logistics streams from the production side somewhere closer to the, to the consumers. I think that's the general theory. If it's a mile, if it's 10 miles, if it's 50 miles, it doesn't really care. But it's something to get the big stream somewhere where I the government allows you to exchange that and to avoid that the big trucks are driving in the inner city. I think that's that's the general concept. The mile, last mile, I think it's a wrong definition. Yeah. And it's not clear. It's it definitely not clear. It's a growing market um, where even the larger platforms um, like Logicals or so are still struggling to find the right solution but it's also something that will definitely develop because the cities will close down 
more and more for the big trucks and there must be any solution how do I bring my goods from the production side into the inner city and there must be a sub-solution somewhere around the, this big hubs. Yeah, well, I mean, what they do is they buy sheds in the outskirts in commercial areas basically which you think are of no use uh, but they have the permit to be operated for 24-7 that's 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 what you need and obviously you can't use an old uh, supermarket um, in the city because you can't that can't be operated 24-7 because if you, if you, I mean, in the good old retail times, we we had the problem that the delivery wasn't allowed between what before six, and then the truck was there at five forty-five, and the first one calls the police. So that certainly doesn't fit a, uh, a logistics uh, center. But they buy sheds in like the outskirts, and they, they they will be used. And what like the big players like Amazon, what they're doing is they they their their IT systems are so smart that they basically predict what you will be buying the other day so and they do that in reality so they 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 whatever uh, uh, what can I do I mean toilet paper so so they they, <laughs> they know that you buy toilet paper every whatever you, consumption is every two weeks and so they predict that that, that you need it the other week and then they and they, 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 do, they do that in reality so they send out the toilet paper just before you know that you want the toilet paper or you need it. <laughs> so that's what they do, and they deliver that to these sheds. So that's that's basically how that works. And yes, and we, now that but now the discussion starts that the way back that they, they just simply take the product, and if they are below what 50 euros, 30 euros, whatever, they just throw them away. So that comes now in, into play that, that 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 the way back actually does not work for the for the low key products. So it's like basically a mass destruction of of values there. So it's like really interesting to see. And they, they, the, the, the market isn't made for it because apparently people do not send the, the, these low-key goods back. So they either they throw it away themselves or they send it back and they destroy it. So, so it's, it's that, that, that seems to work, but the delivery doesn't. And, and yes, what it means, they, they need to be able to deliver within four hours. That's the, that's the goal. And so you, that's the circles they create now. Yeah, and certainly in the in the UK. I mean, last week as well, we were at Transport Logistics, um, doing a session there on the future of logistics. Um, and one of those areas there is also about how um, sustainability, particularly whether that's electri electrified vehicles or um, beginning to move more into mixed use, how you'd actually be able to to blend, you know, city logistics, urban logistics. You know, going back to really using people on bicycles to deliver, for example, mm -hmm. you know, so that you then have the sort of outer ring where that enables you to deliver enough goods from the big sheds into there. And in the UK, there's a there's a lot of what are now redundant um, either light industrial mm -hmm. um, centres. Um, which allow there to be those goods vehicles coming in and out um, and where the yields are substantially different to what you would receive for logistics. So, so there are a lot of people buying up those sites but there's also, and I don't know if you have them here in Germany in the same way, but um, there were kind of slightly out of town retail parks that had a lot of the electrical goods ones in those kinds of things and a, a lot of those are, are fading mm -hmm. but again they're normally near larger roads and they were distribution hubs so that's already there um, and one of my kind of pet theories is that everything gradually goes back to a hundred years ago whatever <laughs> happens so in, in retail when um, certainly in, in the UK when the first kind of Selfridges opened it was all about experience um, you used to have um, everything delivered uh, by bicycle um, because there weren't cars um, you used to still be able to get 10 posts a day in London because there were no emails um, <laughs> and you used to have logistics right in the heart of every city of every village and it was called a post office so I just think that things will come back to that kind of if, if you can if you can begin to get more sustainable ways, whether that's electric vans, whether that's whatever it is, the sustainability bit will be the key and a change of mindset within government, which has happened in, in some countries and it'll be interesting to see how that develops here. Um, that's my take on it. And we haven't done the listed ones. Any idea why listed stocks are dropping with retail? Is that an equity 
story rather than a real estate story? Does anybody have a view on it? So coming back, this industry has developed the last 10 years tremendously. So the whole real estate, in, I'm in Germany now, right? In other countries, it's completely different. And um, when you look at market cap development the last, since 2008 roughly, um, on real estate, it's, it's, it's enormous. So SDAX, MDAX, we have now a DAX 30 company, a real blue chip company with Monovia. Um, but obviously, when markets are difficult, and I think 2018 was difficult in particular, to s the first quarter 2018 was a bloodbath for everyone, then new companies, new industries get hit much harder. That's a very simple rule. So that means when we, and I'm coming back to this, ESG, all the things that in other industries are standard, when we have catched up there, stabilized, showing sustainability in the business, then also stock prices will take out volatility because obviously as every other stakeholders, you want to have, so to say, security safety, that that works a longer time. And I think this was a bit what we saw in 2018. Okay, good. I want to leave some time for um some, some time for networking and you to be able to ask questions to the speakers as well individually. Um, last question from me is, uh, and let's take 30 seconds each, um, so where do you see the best opportunities? Do you see them in Germany at the moment or are you going to be brave and say that actually the best opportunities are outside Germany? Very simple, <laughs> following the mega trends in micro living. That is the <coughs> best you can do now because there are mega trends, there is low competition, low institutionalization, and this is what we will do in Europe. Excellent. I think that was almost exactly 30 seconds. We're going to be able to judge <laughs> that. Um, Carsten. Uh, I agree. It's, it's like to invest either into the operation of real estate, so going away from bricks and mortar only, and the other idea I, I see is that you buy locations which are you can't du duplicate basically, so coastline, mountain views, blah, blah, blah. I think that will drive pr the prices, that will drive tremendously over the next years. Okay, good, Nathan. Uh, I'll stuck on Berlin, and as Lars said, he grew up in Berlin. I'm still growing up in Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and Berlin uh, uh, used to have and still has a kind of magic, and it will continue to have a magic, but this magic was related to very low real estate prices. Now Berlin has become more or less normal. Prices came up. Berlin has become a normal city, and the challenge is to politics not to ruin this and to continue to stay uh, Berlin to keep Berlin as a, an attractive hotspot for investments and here intelligent solutions have to be found to make it more easier for the population to live in, affor in affordable apartments and also to be connected to those who wish to live outside the center with local traffic uh, transportation. Great. Tobias. Um, as I said, we, last year we bought a property in Bochum um, as a, as a value-add investment together with joint venture partners. We are now in the middle of refurbishing it. Uh, we fully leased it to uh, the federal government of Germany with a long-term lease. This is the thing we currently focus on, we look at, and especially in the North Rhine-Westphalia and Ruhrpott area, because there you can still buy it at, at rather, not, not low, but moderate prices. And the second approach is, um, yeah, those, those backbone cities, um, 50,000 plus minus um, inhabitants where you can buy um, commercial properties at yeah, multiples between 8 to 12 times the rent and they're almost as stable as, um, no not almost, they, they are to my understanding they're more stable than, than properties you buy in, in the top seven cities. Great.